and Smetty here. Well, you're you're a real student of the game, Mike. I'm a student. I'm a student of the tailgate. Welcome all to another edition of Golick and Smetty. I am Mike Golick Sr. She is Jess Matana. And if you are a college football fan, you will love this edition. If you're a Notre Dame hater, maybe not so much. Because we're breaking down fighting Irish football, Jess. It's about time we do that, don't you think? Finally. I mean, I think we've showed so much restraint in the last few months. We started this podcast in March, I think. And so there hasn't been a whole lot of Notre Dame football stuff to talk about, Mike. And we've showed restraint not covering Tyler Buckner's uh, preseason spring ankle injury and the (laughs) Notre Dame recruiting class and all the things that we could have talked about. So we saved it all for this episode. And we're going to have Pete Sampson from The Athletic on to talk about uh, this year's Notre Dame football team. Yeah, he's been covering Notre Dame for over 20, uh, I think it's his 22nd year. So we will jump into that and that preview. So we've got college football starting very soon. NFL starts a little bit after that. We had preseason Game number one, which to me still just uh, the most important thing is players get up after every play. That should be the Mm -hmm. the fans only uh, saving grace or thing they exhale about is get up after every play. But I'll say this quickly. There were some injuries because you're a Pittsburgh Steeler fan. Oh, boy. I mean, you got a Mm. three headed monster race here, which I thought Trubisky was going to win out of the gate. I think he's going to be the starter in week one. But Mason Rudolph is trying to make, uh, you know, he's been the backup for Ben for a few years, trying to be the guy. And then the only first-round quarterback, Kenny Pickett, out of pit, playing on his home field right there. Some of his former teammates were there. He had a big fan club. Dude absolutely lit it up. You had to be ecstatic about that. Oh, I was. And George Pickens, too. The the draft pick out of Georgia, the wide receiver. So, Mike, I – um. You know, you were you were on you've been on radio for for decades, right? I'm sure when you watch sports, sometimes you're already formulating an opinion yes. about what you're going to say about it. You know, on Monday or whatever day on your show. So going into the Steelers preseason game, I was already thinking of a way to dismiss bad performance by these quarterbacks and say, well, it's a preseason game. We can't we can't take anything from it and kind of expecting the worst. And then like lo and behold, all three of them played really well. And now I'm like, well. My uh, my take is that this is extremely indicative of how good these quarterbacks are, and, and we should be very ecstatic about it. So I've kind of done like a 180 on that from thinking like, oh, well, if they play bad, it doesn't count. But if they play good, it's it's really, really good for me. I'm very excited about it. Yeah, it must mean something. You're covered both ways. <laughs> it's the way to look at it. I mean, right. again, this is the one where there's only the three-headed monster. You have the uh, Baker Mayfield and Sam Darnold, the, uh, the two going after it in Carolina. But Mitch yeah. went. Mitch Trubisky went four or seven with a touchdown. Rudolph went nine of fifteen with a touchdown, uh, and Kenny Pickett went thirteen of fifteen with two touchdowns. No interceptions in this game. You mentioned uh, Pickens out of Georgia. He had three catches for forty three yards and a touchdown as well. So uh, again, I don't get overly crazy in preseason, especially when guys are going against the second team, but. When it's their first time out on the field, you give them credit for what they did. All you can do is study what they did, and they'll break down the film. Was he making the reads quick enough? Was he getting rid of the ball quick enough? Blah, 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 all that stuff. So we'll wait and see. But but a nice start, I thought, for the only uh, first-round quarterback in Kenny Pickett. I thought uh, things went well for him. We talked about guys getting up. Um, Zach Wilson, unfortunately, did not. Uh, the Jets quarterback, uh, he ran and tried to maybe get a little more yardage than he should have on a run and came up limping and then went back down. And so he had to get uh, some surgery or he's going to get surgery done in his meniscus. He's not sure if he's going to, they're not sure if he's going to play week one or not. If not elite quarterback, Joe Flacco uh, will be ready to go. But uh, oh, yeah, th- that's one. I mean, again, just, we talk about this all the time. It's a one thing you, you can't predict. And we've already talked about other guys who have been hurt and done for the season already with knee injuries or Achilles injuries. But man, when it's your quarterback and you're looking to take the next step and all of a sudden Zach Wilson, who missed games last year with a knee, is all of a sudden on the shelf early with a knee. I mean, that that just you, every every Jet fan, I can't imagine what Stu Gotch is saying. Right now, no. or said when he saw that. I know, I, mean, I know exactly what he's saying. Uh-huh. I I hate them. That's what he's yeah, saying. That's yeah. what he always says. Uh, but you're right, Mike. And and before we get to uh, 
over analytical about preseason NFL football, we should probably toss to our interview with Pete Sampson because there are going to be real football games very soon. This is actually the last weekend before college football season starts because week zero is the first week or the, the final weekend of August. And then week one starts, you know, the following weekend with Notre Dame, Ohio State being the first game of the season. So we'll talk to Pete. And then after the interview, we'll kind of give our picks for the season and, and talk about some Notre Dame odds for, for 2022. And joining us now, as promised, uh, staff writer for The Athletic, Pete Sampson, who has been covering Notre Dame football for now his 22nd year. You don't look that old, Pete, I'll tell you that much. And I almost feel like you should have been covering my years. You covered both my boys' years. You actually covered the last year of Bob Davey now to the first year of Marcus Freeman. So that's six regimes. So as we welcome you to Golik and Smetty, um, I'm wondering – so you have seen the incoming new coach other times. How did this one compare with Marcus Freeman? I think for Marcus, it's it's the head coach that was probably most embraced by the fan base the quickest. Uh, and I think that there has been, after Brian Kelly, there was sort of this like desire among Notre Dame fans like, Can there be a head coach that I want to hug and will want to hug me back? (laughs) And I think that relationship with Marcus is already sort of off the ground. So it's, um, you know, with Brian Kelly, I think there was a little skepticism because the the program was in a much different spot than it is now with Marcus. Like everyone's used to winning. But, um, you know, the young, good looking, energetic guy, he's he's somebody you want to be around. Uh, He's somebody who wants you to be around him. And so I think that that's probably the biggest difference from where things were with Brian Kelly. You know, uh, along those lines, I, I'm wondering, just, just, I would just have one on Brian Kelly. And really it's your thought of, as we mentioned, the, the amount of coaches that you've seen, all of them have been fired. Notre Dame coaches are usually fired or retire. Brian Kelly left on his own. What was that kind of on the inside there and, and what people thought about him doing it a different way than what had normally been done? Well, I, I think as you guys both know, Notre Dame fans have a little bit of ego about themselves. Ah. So when, when um, the head coach is like, I have, there's a better opportunity somewhere else, that doesn't go over very well. Uh, so they, that's, that's all part of it. And I think, you know, after 12 years, there was a certain amount of, I don't know, it was kind of stale. Um, if winning 10 games every year can feel stale. But I think it got to a point where a lot of Notre Dame fans were wondering like, okay, is this is this as good as it gets? Like, is there a ceiling above where we are right now? And Marcus Freeman sort of, I think, lets the fan base dream and think about like, yeah, this, we don't need to settle for just making it to the playoff and getting your doors blown off. There's, there's maybe a a level above and beyond this. So that's, I think that's all part of like why Freeman has been embraced so much is he, he feels like potential. And I'm not sure that Brian Kelly felt that way after 12 years. So as the, you know, one of the national beat writers for Notre Dame, for a lot of people, you're the conduit between, you know, being actually at practices and games and and then like fans who, who might not get to see the team in person, et cetera, know what's really going on in the inside. So I'm wondering how, um, when you're gauging the reaction to the Marcus Freeman hire or Brian Kelly leaving, how you kind of interact with the fan base, because I think, I think Notre Dame fans, we can be a very self-loathing group of people. <laughs> Um, I, I know at least in like my circles, there's a lot of Notre Dame gallows humor. So I'm wondering how you gauge that and how you parse through, you know, like your mailbag questions and your emails and your, your tweets and everything and, and get, try to get a sense for what fans are really feeling there. I, I love the gallows humor of the Notre Dame fan base. It's it, I think it's a fringe benefit of the job. Uh, I would say like when the coaching change was happening, I was very careful that I was only tweeting about the coaching change because I didn't want people to have me on mobile alerts and it'd be like, hey, here's something that my nine-year-old did at basketball practice today and be like, no, that's not what we're here for. So I, you know, I, I think that, you know, whether I'm, it's social media or, you know, I, I'll go and talk to alumni clubs. I think you just sort of pick up a pretty consistent energy from the fan base that there's, I know there's some real optimism and hope that this is a head coach that, you know, you can get behind. Um, Very rarely in the sport do I think head coaches have lose a first game the way that Marcus Freeman lost the first game. And yet the, it still feels like the honeymoon period is still going on. Like 
I think the the fan base is willing to sort of offer Freeman like this kind of grace period to learn on the job, which I think we have to be honest with ourselves. Like that's what a first time head coach does. They learn on the job. So I think that that part of the the fan base reaction is interesting. I But it's I try to <laughs> try not to read too much into Twitter comments, but whether it's emails or mailbags or just alumni visits, like where you're actually in the same room with people, I think the vibe is the same that that people are just sort of excited to see what Marcus Friedman could do. So go- going back to the Fiesta Bowl for a second, I think one of the reasons that fans are sort of giving Marcus Freeman a pass is that, you know, obviously it was his first game as the head coach, but also he didn't have his full coaching staff in place. And so there wasn't even a, a defensive coordinator who had been hired yet. Now Notre Dame has hired Al Golden to be the defensive coordinator. I currently live in Miami and I work with a lot of uh, Miami Hurricanes <laughs> fans who tell me bad things about Al Golden all the time. So I need you, Pete, to tell me that I should be excited for Al Golden and how I can win these arguments that we're having on the Dan Levitard show about Al Golden. Well, I, th- I think you should definitely point out to how many Tennessee fans thought that Harry Heastan was awful when Brian Kelly <laughs> hired him in 2012. Because when that hire got made, the reaction was just like, are you kidding me? This guy is a joke. Lo and behold, definitely not a joke. So the Al Golden hire, it's not, if you're a defensive coordinator for a defensive head coach, I don't think that Marcus Freeman is going to be asking Al Golden to do any of the stuff that he did at Miami, manage the program, uh, you know, be the, sort of the culture setter around the the facility. Like Al Golden can just coach defense and he can just sort of be more like an NFL style guy, which, you know, he did quite well with the Bengals last year. So I, I wouldn't read too much into that just because the jobs are so different. But in terms of, yeah, opposing fan bases and their opinions and how much merit they have, I would just, I would go straight to the Tennessee fans in 2011 who are like Harry Heastan. That's, that's a total disaster waiting to happen. Yeah, the uh, the fan short for fanatic really comes out in the college side of it. And you mentioned Harry Heastan, I think one of the one of the best hires they made. I know Pete, you've seen him a couple of times now. My son was coached by him. He's a he's a hard coach, there's no doubt about it. But I think he is a great coach. And the O line, it seems you have Jarrett Patterson who is coming coming back again this year, and I think Harry was one of the reasons for it. Uh, but but I. That has to be one of the reasons because in in a bigger question, coming off that loss, breaking in another new quarterback, here at Notre Dame sits preseason number five. So a lot of people are like all you know gassed up for Marcus, which is a cool thing. He's a great guy, but we know it has to be you know wins and losses have to count. Did you think the number five ranking was a, a little high? I sort of looked at it as somebody had to be five. <laughs> Why not Notre Dame? Um, you know, it's like there's clearly a one, two, three, right? And then yeah. after that, if Notre Dame was four, if Notre Dame was eight, it's kind of all the same to me. Um, you know, we'll find out on September 3rd how close they are to one, two, or three. But there's a pretty big gap between three and then the rest of the top 10. But I, I think Notre Dame is, they've earned enough credibility over the last five years to kind of get the benefit of the doubt. So, you know, I think in, in looking at this team, again, opening up at Ohio State, uh, the preseason number two team in the country behind uh, Alabama, uh, it, it all starts, as we know now, maybe not as much as, as in colleges and the pros, but uh, Tommy Reese, the offensive coordinator, now breaking in a new quarterback for the second time after Ian Book was a quarterback for 10 years, it felt like. Uh, so uh, Tyler Buckner gets to start, a guy who threw 35 passes last year, ran the ball 46 times, now has the keys to this Tommy Reese offense. So I guess first and foremost, I think a lot of Notre Dame fans want to know, how does this guy look? He looks good. He looks much more like a starting quarterback out there opposed to a guy that was just trying to watch Jack Cohn and then do what Jack Cohn did in practice. Um, he was he was a follower last year. He didn't lead at all because he wasn't ready to and Notre Dame didn't need him to. So that's... You sort of see a different presence about him out there. And even talking to some of the receivers, this is, I mean, this is going to be a in-development thing where if you're a veteran receiver, Braden Lindsay told me this uh, this week, just like if Buckner makes a mistake in practice, you're very conscious of the fact, go up to him, say like, it's okay, we'll work through this. Let's talk through this. Whereas if it was Cone or Book, you just sort of like brush it off, move to the next thing. Um, but I know this coaching staff is very optimistic about where Buckner could take the offense 
long term, maybe not on September 3rd, as he's a pass first quarterback who can run, which is, I think, not how people see him after how he was used last year. But long term, there is no doubt, I think, with the staff that they feel like they could have a playmaker at quarterback opposed to a game manager. And look, Ian Book and Jack Cohn did excellent at that. But to take the next step, I think they they need more of a playmaker back there. And they think Buckner ultimately can be that guy. I think one of the the hallmarks of the Brian Kelly era for me was that there was always a quarterback competition going into week one. It didn't <laughs> seem like he really felt comfortable naming a starting quarterback this early in camp. Um, and maybe if, even if he did, it didn't, it always seemed like that person's job was in jeopardy. And, and I wonder if, if you think this is a kind of, uh, um, Marcus Freeman doing his own thing and, and kind of making this call to avoid some of that. And some of the criticisms Kelly got for not really ever feeling like he was confident in his, his starter going into week one. I think probably Reese drove it even more and he lived that stuff, right? Like he was on the business end of those, those quarterback dramas for, basically all four years here, you know, and, and Reese was quick to point out over the weekend, like Pine is going to play. There's, there's going to be a moment where Buckner tweaks an ankle or pulls a hamstring and he can't go. So that I, I, you know, you want to avoid the dramas of Golson versus Zaire, Golson versus Reese, the Chris Reese stuff, the Kaisers. I, I mean, the Wimbush book stuff is not healthy to do that. Um, I don't think that, the fact that they named a starter this quickly is um, a nod to that. I think it has more to do with like the fact that everyone inside the program knows Buckner is the guy. Um, I mean, I've had some people wonder during spring practice, why didn't they just name a starter at the end of spring? Because Buckner was that far ahead. So I think it has much more to do with Buckner than all the other stuff. But the other stuff is just, it's best to be avoided if you can. Um, so I think getting this done in week one was important. You know, so then going to the season, I know this will be tough to answer because we really don't have any any samples of it, but Brian Kelly was also known when the season started, he'll yank a quarterback in a heartbeat. I mean, it was just constantly looking over your shoulder. And can you get a sense of how that may be this year? I mean, is Buckner looking over his shoulder going, uh-oh, do I get a, get a quick hook here like in the last regime? Not yet. I, th- I think Buckner would have to do something to – to deserve a quick hook. Um, And I think probably you can get through Ohio state as long as he doesn't come out with kind of the deer in the headlights cliche. Look, they'll be okay. But uh, they much like Marcus, I think is going to need room to grow and space to grow as a first time head coach. You're going to have to give Buckner some space to grow as a a first year starting quarterback. So it's to ruin him, but with a quick hook, I I think that they will be extra careful not to do that with him. Um, you know, but again, Marcus doesn't have a track record of, of quarterback changes. We don't really know. Um, but I, I think ultimately Reese will drive that decision. And he is much more in tune with Tyler Buckner than than Marcus Freeman. So, so from a positional standpoint for this team, what are the strong, the strongest positions out there? Offensive line, defensive line, I think have a chance to both be great. Uh, I think their offensive line could be the most improved position group in the country. Uh, and I think the defensive line, you know, you know about Foskey and Jason Adam Malola, but Riley Mills to me looks like a future pro on the other defensive end spot. Uh, I think they've got a lot of depth at, the, at both those positions. So it's built from the inside out. And then I think, you know, if there was an underrated position, that we probably don't talk about it enough. I think linebacker has a chance to be very, very good. They're old, they're experienced. Uh, and I think that fits nicely with a defensive coordinator who probably wants to do some more complicated NFL style stuff, not to give people like any BVG uh, vibes here, but like <laughs> Al Golden, yeah. I think is, is going to push the envelope in terms of how complicated the defense can be, which is okay to do if you have Jack Kaiser and JD Bertrand and Bo Bauer who have been around forever. Um, so I think, the offensive line has a chance to be great. I think the front seven on defense has a chance to be very, very good. Well, the self-loathing Notre Dame fan in me needs to ask about some of the issues, which obviously this week there was a big injury in the wide receiver room. Um, Avery Davis, who's a, a captain of the team, is out with another ACL injury, which I know is a is a devastating blow for, for someone who's kind of senior on the team and very well liked. But also it seems like that position group may be a little thin. Uh, can you talk a little bit about um, who we might expect to see playing against Ohio State with some of the injuries in that room? Yeah, it's it's a lot thin. Um, they have 
they've done a poor job managing that position and recruiting. And then they've got injuries on top of that. It's, I mean, you, you ought to practice now and they're working with basically five healthy scholarship receivers. And one of them is a, a walk on who's now on scholarship. So that's, that's not good. Um, talked to Chancey Stuckey, the new receivers coach. I asked him like, what's your, you know, what's your ideal number for receivers? And he's like, having 10 to rotate out there would be good. So they're, they're half of that. Um, huh. So that's not a healthy place to be. I think Lorenzo Styles has a chance to be like a true number one. He was great in the Fiesta Bowl. I, he, you know, is he going to be what Kevin Austin was at Kevin Austin's best? Maybe, you know, I don't think he's just physically that imposing, but um, just a, a really top, top athlete. You know, Tobias Merriweather is the freshman that, you know, people are excited about. I think midseason is probably realistic for him to really turn it on and be a, a serious part of the rotation, but he'll be out there against Ohio State. And then you're really hoping that Braden Lindsay as a fifth year senior could put it all together. Um, they don't really have a lot of options. It's I don't think they're moving anybody to the position. Uh, there's there's no help coming in the transfer portal. So it's you need Styles, Lindsay, Merriweather. Uh, Jaden Thomas has played a little bit last year. He may start moving forward. Um, it did not have a catch last season. So it's Reese is going to have to get real creative. I mean, they have a lot of depth and I think talent at tight end, the other running back should be good. Their offensive line could be great and they have a mobile quarterback. So you're probably building around building your offense around the tight ends of the running backs more than you ever would think to do with the receivers. Yeah. It's certainly does, Michael. Does Chris Mayer. Fink have yeah. any uh, eligibility left? <laughs> We well, it's, uh, they have uh, ah, Matt Salerno ah. now, who is like sort of being viewed as a poor man's Chris Fink. <laughs> uh, does not I, I can say that he, Salerno has not torched scholarship DBs the way Fink did when we were at practices. So but I don't want to get too carried away with Salerno, but that's just, man, that, that's just sort of where they are with receivers right now. They're hoping that a, a converted wa- a former walk-on can help. This is the classic... Uh someone gets a chance next man up, you know, and, and hopefully somebody surprises in a good way uh, that said, okay, they were ready for the moment. Cause it's, it's going to be tough. So sticking with kind of the skill position, we knew they were going to be thin there. How about in the secondary? Obviously you lose a Kyle Hamilton, but you do pick up a Brandon Joseph, the transfer from Northwestern, which I think was a, was a beautiful thing for the, for the deep secondary then. But how about the rest of that secondary? I am much higher on the secondary than I think um, the average fan would be coming off the Fiesta Bowl uh, when they just got (laughs) shredded. Um, I think Clarence Lewis is a much better player than you saw against Oklahoma State. Like He's a good college cornerback. He did not look like that, did not play like that on January 1. And I think Cam Hart's probably a mid-round draft pick a year from now. So, you know, with him, Tariq Bracey at the nickel – Brandon Joseph at the back, I think that's, like you said, that was a critical pickup because I think the rest of their safeties are just sort of okay. Um, it should be, the secondary I think will be fine. Uh, it's not going to be a strength of the team, but to sort of sit here, well, maybe against Ohio State, you should sit there and you know sort of hold yeah. your knees in the field yeah. fetal position. <laughs> but I think for the rest of the season, um, the secondary should be pretty good. It's just, that's, uh, <laughs> they're not set up for a lot of success on game one against Ohio State. There was a, a lot of off-season conference realignment news, obviously, and I saw um, obviously the the Big Ten NBC deal might be announced soon. And I saw Sports Business Journal um, saying that they they expect Notre Dame to remain independent because of that. That's also something Mike and I talked about last week. So good job to us. Um, is that <laughs> is that something that you see as an indication that there won't be any Notre Dame to the Big Ten movement anytime soon? I think it's like it's a signal that there's not going to be any movement yet on that. Um, I think Notre Dame is going to be good with independence for like the next round of TV contracts. And at that point, we'll know what the number is for the Big Ten. Like how high into the billions did that go? What does the ACC look like five years from now? What does the college football playoff look like whenever its new iteration comes out? It's like you spend any time with Jack Swarbrick, like he's not going to make a, de- a a permanent decision. You cannot unring the bell when you when you say I'm in the we're in the Big Ten. He's not going to make a permanent decision with incomplete information. And I think that Notre Dame is still in the incomplete information mode with the Big Ten. Um, it makes a lot of sense if things that are likely to break break that way. If the Big Ten is making 1.5 billion dollars then yeah, uh, I think Notre Dame has to consider that. 
USC and UCLA being part of the conference? Does Stanford join with Notre Dame? Like, I think joining a conference is completely different than it was in 1999 when, you know, the West Coast of the Big Ten was Iowa City. Now it's Los Angeles. The East Coast was State College. Now it's New York City, if we're being generous to Rutgers. And Washington DC. It's so the Jersey Shore. But yeah, that's, that's that's fine too. I mean, there's a lot of Notre Dame people who love the Jersey Shore, Mike Craig included. So it's uh, <laughs> that's not I a knock think, to the Jersey Shore. No, but. no. High praise. Love um, the Jersey Shore. I just think that like the Big Ten makes a lot of sense now, uh, or will make a lot of sense in five years, whereas it didn't five years earlier. Um, but you're a shore brick. You you take as much time as you possibly can with this decision. Cause once you say yes, there's really no going back from it. Yeah, listen, Jack's in a great position. You know, he's, he's answering the phone more than he's making calls. So that's always a nice position to be in and agree or disagree, Pete. I mean, I, I think it comes down to two things. One, the ease to get into the playoffs. And once they expand the playoffs, it will be. And the only thing, if you remain independent, if they go conference champs as top seeds, then you couldn't be one of the top seeds. And the other is, what's your money line? You know, where where the Big Ten may get this monster deal, but if you have a comfortable deal, whatever that is, we heard that number of $75 million thrown out in a report of a comfortable lever for Notre Dame of money to make and a easier path to the playoffs. Any doubt in your mind? I think I think they would just stay independent then. Yeah, I, if they can afford to stay independent, they'll stay independent. Um, I don't think the college football playoff is going to be a lever that forces them to join because it's going to expand. Um, to me, it's 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 your budget. What does that look like? You know, can you afford, like, literally afford to be independent when Rutgers is making fifty million dollars more than you? Right. Um, <laughs> or you know, I think that feels uncomfortable for Notre Dame, but like what should really feel uncomfortable is Notre Dame. If you're trying to win a national championship against Ohio state and Alabama, and they're making 50 or $75 million more than you, then like, okay, well, are you, are you fighting this fight with a hand tied behind your back? Because you can't invest in facilities or coaches as much as a team that wants to win it all should. So it's, I think it's where you just, if you're Jack Swarbrick, you got to keep monitoring the situation, but um, the budget I think is, it's a real thing. And I, I don't think I ever would have said that before um, with Notre Dame, but I think that they, you have to look at your bottom line and be like, can we afford to continue to be independent? Cause it's getting more expensive every year. As a fan though, I feel like that rationalization, like it doesn't mesh well with a university that literally like paints its main building in 24 karat gold. Yes. Um, and I understand ah. that there's, there's different budgets for different things. And there's this multi-billion dollar endowment that doesn't necessarily mean there's like a pile of cash laying around like that most of that money is designated to different things but i do find that like uh there as as a someone who can speak for for parts of the fan base like if that's the the reason for joining it's like oh now all of a sudden notre dame's crying poor uh, or doesn't have the money to remain by like have remain independent and have this part of its identity that i think for for a lot of reasons a lot of fans connect to like maybe that's not something that meshes really well obviously you know what you said if the number is that high maybe that all is forgiven but I I do find that there's a little bit of a a paradoxical message being sent there there there's no doubt you if you're Notre Dame and you're joining the Big Ten you cannot lead with a talking point of like we just couldn't afford not to like that (laughs) that's not going to go over very well with anybody uh and I think that's why like if you join the Big Ten and USC is a conference game. Maybe Stanford comes in. You have you keep that thing going. Your schedule, instead of playing Georgia Tech and Louisville, you're playing Wisconsin and Iowa. Like to me, like if you look at what a Big Ten schedule would look like, it's a lot more appealing than what their current version of independence is. So there, are, there are other upsides, and there has to be other upsides because just like here are our budget spreadsheets. Like it's not. You're not winning any hearts and minds that way. No, no, you definitely are not. Um, one other thing on Marcus, when Marcus first got here, you know, he was considered a great cor- uh, a recruiter and boy, oh boy, he has hit the ground running there. I almost can't ask the question of overall, can NIL hurt Notre Dame? Because the other schools, you know, the A&Ms and the Bamas all talk about, you know, the booster money they get together. And that that's still like taboo here at Notre Dame, even though they can do it legally now. But that doesn't seem to matter now with these next couple of at least these next couple of recruiting classes uh, with Marcus. Talk about Marcus and his recruiting and and just 
the reputation that he has and how it's paying off. Well, I'm guessing you guys have spent some time around him. Like he has a magnetic personality. He's somebody that you want to be around and that shows in recruiting. And he, he works his butt off with it. Like I've, when you talk to recruits and you ask them to compare the Brian Kelly approach to the Marcus Freeman approach, like they basically literally bust out laughing because they're like, <laughs> I never talked to Brian Kelly and Marcus calls me every week. Um, I mean, there are players on the team starters who did not have Brian Kelly's cell phone number. Every recruit and every player on the team can contact Marcus whenever they want. So that part of the personality I think really shows in recruiting. Um, he works very, very hard at it. I wouldn't say NIL is not hurting Notre Dame because I think that if if we were living in a pre-NIL world, I think Notre Dame would have a far and away the number one class in the country, like right. running away with it. Um, so they've had to overcome that. And I think that's it's on Notre Dame to, one, get your NIL stuff together, which you know Brady Quinn's collective, I think, is doing a pretty good job of. But also make sure that the kids you're recruiting, NIL is not their first priority. It can be their third or fourth priority. Like Notre Dame's cool with that. But if you're looking to maximize your NIL revenues where that's, you know, number one on your list of recruiting criteria, there are probably better places for you than Notre Dame. Um, so I think that that's something a staff is figuring out as they go. Like we got to make sure we know what these kids priorities are early. Cause if you're chasing kids that then really want to get an NIL late, that makes it kind of difficult to hold on to commitments. Pete, last one from me. Listen, we know what ball players think of and coaches. When you go to Notre Dame, your goal is the national championship because there's no conference. We, we, all, we all know that. What in Marcus's first year, another new quarterback starting out this year, what are your realistic expectations for the team this year? I think 10 and 2 would be a really good season. Um, and I'm, I'm sort of factoring in they're going to be 0 and 1. And then to go 10 and 1 the rest of the way. That means you either got Clemson or you got USC. Right. And it means you won every game that you should. I mean, that's, I don't, you know, for all the flack Brian Kelly takes, he won every game he was supposed to win. Like, that's hard to do. Like, not a lot well, of coaches could do that. Later on in his, yeah. se- in his I'm tenure. Saying, like, 2016 <laughs> didn't win a lot of games they should have won. Um, we won't but, talk about South Florida or, no, you know. No. No, or Duke. Um, yeah, oh, Tulsa, Duke, Navy Tulsa, in yeah. 2010. I mean, right. we could go on and on. Oh, but yeah, right. The last five years, Notre Dame, you knew what you were going to get from Notre Dame every week because Brian Kelly is just, he was he was a commodity you could trust. Um, you also knew what you were going to get when you ended up in the playoff. So I think if Marcus can, you know, get through BYU, North Carolina, Boston College, like these games that like, if you play a C plus game, you could lose. Um, that's going to be a test of him as a head coach. And then, you know, to win one of the two big games in November, finish 10 and two, go to a new year six bowl. Hey, maybe you can win a, a major bowl game for the first time since the 93 season that it finished with a top five recruiting class. I think that would be a very, very good debut for, for Marcus. Yeah. We got to get that graphic out of here. That shows all the, the bowl games that yeah. Notre Dame has lost. Yeah. I cannot believe like, I started covering Notre Dame in 2001. This is still a thing. Oh, it's 22 years later. It's this, is, I, this has awesome. been my whole life, Pete. I, yes. <laughs> I, don't yeah. even, don't, I don't think I've ever seen them win a, a big postseason game in my life. So, yeah, I, I feel you. All right. Well, you mentioned that Marcus Freeman was a great recruiter. He did recruit our friend Mike here to go to the desert with him for a, a jersey <laughs> reveal. So we are we are definitely so far on the Marcus Freeman bandwagon. So thank you for joining us and and uh, confirming our biases that he is indeed very cool and awesome. And we hope that he wins games. So uh, Pete, thank you again for joining. Excited to read your coverage this fall. Um, good luck with the rest of training camp. Thanks. I appreciate you guys. Well, that was great to talk to Pete. Uh, I can't wait to get out and watch some of the practices myself. As as I told Pete before we started this, I want to make sure it's a hitting practice. So I'm not going to go stand out somewhere <laughs> for an hour and a half and not watch O and D linemen get after it and hit one another. So uh, it definitely has to be a hitting practice. And uh, I, you know, I agree with him. Uh, just the strength, and, and a lot of times that's been that way at Notre Dame has been the O line and the D line. And they are two very, very strong units, as he talked about. And I agree, the front seven, especially on that defense. But that O-line, that D-line, I don't think you can make too much of Harry Heastan. 
I mean, I don't think you can say it enough about Harry Heastan coming back and coaching that old line and just how much he's going to help. But, you know, as we know, while I said, and, and I do think it's true, relying on the quarterback in college is not as all inclusive and, you know, heart palpitating as you got to get that quarterback in the NFL, but still you'd love to have an excellent quarterback. And, you know, Notre Dame's got a guy who, you know, just 35 passes last year, just, just not the experience that you were hoping for. And right out of the gate with Ohio state. Mm -hmm. So should we give our, our picks for the season, Mike Notre Dame schedule, you know, we, we don't have to go through each game, but there are going to be some tougher games with Ohio State and USC and, and even Clemson coming back to South Bend in November. Um, Pete said he thought 10 and two would be a good season. I hate making like predictions on on the record because I'm always. Yeah, I hate doing or, it too. or I'm afraid yeah. they're going to they're going to jinx them. But are you, are you comfortable making a prediction of what the uh, record will be at the end of the man, season? Man, it's 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 going to be tough because you look at that Ohio State game and you're like, man, it, I think so many people are, are, are giving them a loss right out of the gate. You know, you're again, breaking in a new quarterback. They have a Heisman, one of the Heisman favorites. Ohio State does a quarterback, great receivers, great skill positions uh, that they normally have. So that that's a tough one. But and and I agree with Pete when he said, you know, you can't let one of those teams that is a C sneak up mm-hmm. and bite you. You got to take care of business, uh, and you got you got to hammer those teams. So is it out of the question that Notre Dame can make the college football playoff? No, because they play some power. And even if you lose to Ohio State and Ohio State goes and runs the table, that obviously turns out to be a great loss for you, but you have to win the rest of your games, which I think they can do. So how about this? I'll go out on a a limb, and I'll say 11-1. and Oh, my God. That is so confident. Yeah, and you know why I'm – Go ahead. What, what, so are you going to give a? I was going to give a much worse prediction. That way, I can kind of like emotionally hedge. Right. Like I feel like Notre Dame. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if they lost like a stinker to like BYU right. in, in Vegas or like uh, you know North Carolina or or even Navy or so. I don't think they'll lose to Navy. I yeah, think those days yeah, are let's over. Hope Navy's. Not, yeah. Or you know Boston College at the end of the season, like in the cold, right. ugh, Senior night. I just. I, I'm so afraid of going back to the the Brian Kelly days of starting off the season really on a high note and then things falling apart halfway through. But I hope that doesn't happen, Mike. I just don't think I'm as confident as you. However, if someone who is not a Notre Dame fan says, "Oh, Notre Dame's only going to be seven and five or eight and four, or whatever, six and six, I will tell them that they're stupid. Yeah. So, like, I can say this, but no one else can say this because if if I if you ask anyone else from like national media reporters, college football reporters, I'm going, I'm with you. I'm like, we can win every game. And in there, I'm saying we again, like, uh, oh, you went the there. Team. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. I, I think they're, I think we have to temper our expectations, Mike. I agree. Here's the way I look at it. When I make picks, Jess is, uh, if I'm right, I look like a genius. And if I'm wrong, pff, who really cares? Somebody will rip me and then we'll forget about it. I'll move <laughs> on. There's way more upside. Uh, you know, if, if I hit, you know, hit it right, then there is downside. downside. They'll just say, oh, he went to Notre Dame. So he thought they'd do better than they did. I'd say, yeah, you're right. Cause maybe I'm picking some with my heart, but you know, when you can have two really good lines of scrimmage, yeah. um, uh, and the best between, you know, Mayer and Bowers, the kid from Georgia, the two best tight ends in the country, you know, good running back stable, but uh, we'll see. But man, what a tough one right out of the gate. Some quick, uh, if you're looking at the uh, DraftKings Sportbook on Notre Dame, I know where I'm going. I may, I may actually throw throw a couple of bucks on on the last one I'm going to tell you about, but their okay. over-under is eight and a half wins. Eight okay, and well, a half so wins. I, I would go with the over, because I think if if you're saying 11 and one, Pete Sampson said 10 and two, I'm going to just say nine and three and, and pick the like the lower end of that. So that's still over eight and a half. So that's interesting. Yeah, that's, it's it's minus 150 for over uh, eight and a half under eight and a half. It's plus 130 to make the playoffs. They're at plus 1000 to make hmm. the playoffs. I think that that's worth uh, that that that's worth a uh, you know a couple of shekels. There, okay. I, I I may uh, I may go down that road. And then college football championship odds. The top one there is Alabama at plus one seventy five. Then Ohio State at plus three hundred. 
Georgia at plus 400. Remember, Notre Dame was preseason number five. But as mm-hmm. far as the odds to win the championship, they're, they're what is it, one, two, three, six? They're ninth. They're listed ninth. So they're behind Alabama, Ohio State, Georgia, Clemson, A&M, USC, Michigan, and Oklahoma. Notre Dame sits at plus 4,500 for the I college mean, be- football championship. Behind, behind Oklahoma, really? Behind Oklahoma. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, seriously. I mean, I guess I could see the arc And behind USC, too, who, like, what what have they done lately? Like, this Notre Dame t- – see, this is where I get angry, Mike, because I know these are – a lot of these calculations are done by computers. Right, but like, right. You know, USC – what have they done lately? First of all, and second of all, like going back to the over and under for for wins, Notre Dame hasn't had a a season with fewer than ten wins since 2016, right. the famously horrific Brian Kelly season. Yes. So, I'm I'm a little skeptical of all of that. So I'm I'm with you. That's an interesting it, it, interesting. It one. does go back to the hard schedule that Notre Dame has. Three of those teams, three of the eight ahead of us, are on our schedule: <laughs> Ohio State, <laughs> USC, and Clemson. So you know it it is going to be a tough schedule, no doubt about it. But Listen, this is when everybody, we're, we're Notre Dame alum, we're Notre Dame fans, so we're excited for our team. And, and, and as everybody should be, Jess, as football starts, we're college first, you know, is, is be excited for your team. Everybody's 0-0, everybody has the hopes of the world and, and hopes things can, uh, can be good. Yeah, and Mike, I'm I'm excited to have this the show with you during football season because yes. I feel like a you've made it abundantly clear that saying we and us about Notre Dame football is cool because yes. you just did it like six times. Yep. So mm-hmm. I'm gonna keep doing that, and I don't feel ashamed of it. Um, and B, I'm excited to hear your expertise during the season and and have you around to react to games with. So I'm I'm really maybe maybe we'll start Notre Dame. We will start out. Oh, and one, but you and I, buddy, we got, we got a full season ahead of us to, to talk about the Irish. So I'm excited for that. Yeah, I am too. And the biggest thing I'm looking forward to, if we, you and I get to do a show out here at Notre Dame is what's your bacon and what you're bringing, <laughs> what you're bringing to the show. That's what excites me most. <laughs>